Yes, I can hear you, Professor. Can uh, you hear Ryan me? or Ben Al, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Professor? Oh, you cannot hear me. That's weird. But well, you knew I was saying that. You can hear me. Maybe I wasn't speaking. How about now? <laughs> okay, just type up. Can you try saying something? See if I can hear you when you make a comment? Yeah, can you hear me? I guess I can't hear the chat either. Why is my okay? Can you hear me now, uh, Professor? Talk again. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, Professor? Stop sharing that. That way, all you have your mute buttons on and something. Can you try unmuting and letting me know if I can hear you, uh, Ryan? Or yeah. Can you hear me, Professor? I see that your mute button's off. I don't see it. I can't hear anything. This, this can't be in, so I'm going to plug this in. The thing I can plug in. Put a pop up notification for chat. Um, let me see if this helps. And it's 10, so better help. Okay, but you can hear me anyway. Oh, and uh, Good, everybody. So, so where we left off with actually not distance at all. I don't know why I still have that. We did that. Yeah. So the big thing I think we we're doing last time and finished up is Bailey's formula. So uh, for a given fixed vertex set, so vertices are labeled one through n. It's not. We're not. I don't care about symmetries. I'm not counting symmetries of trees. I'm counting fixed vertices one through n, how many trees are there on that vertex? And there's a nice formula. N vertices is n to the n minus two. Uh, to remind you of the uh, example, maybe look at n is equal to four. So if you ignore the vertex labels, there's really only two types of trees. No proof, let's just do that. There's two types of trees. But now if you think, well, really the vertices are labeled one through four, um, then uh, this one, there's actually four different possible Labelings, which are give you different graphs, all right. So, uh, depending on which one label this one is labeled, and then this one uh, you can label in four factorial ways. You divide by two because flipping it, it gives you the same graph. So we're looking, really counting labeled graphs here. Um, I'll remind you of the uh, procedure and a couple things about it, although we're not going to prove it again. What happens is that given any uh, tree on, like, like here, on vertices labeled 1 through n, so in this case, eight vertices, the vertices are labeled 1 through 8. There's this procedure you go, you delete leaves 1 by 1 in a certain order, always getting smaller tree, quitting when you've reached two vertices left. Each time you write down the neighbor of the leaf, so for example, the first one you delete, you, you pick the smallest available leaf. In this case, 2 is the smallest available leaf. You delete it and you write down its neighbor. So each time you delete a leaf, you write down its neighbor, you get this code here called the prefer code. And it turns out there's that's a bijection. For any prefer code, you can, there's a, exactly one corresponding uh, tree on n vertices and uh, vice versa. Any questions that spring to mind based on this or anything you remember from yesterday's uh, laptop? So one interesting thing we noted, which turned out to be important, 
is that the degree of a vertex uh, tells you how many times it appears in the code. Let's look at, I don't know, four or something, for example, here. Four has degree three. As we go along, look at each time four appears in this, uh, in this code. And this step, three is removed, which means three is a leaf currently, and the degree of four ends up going down by one. And that's why four appears in the list. Four appears in the list again the next time because it's neighbor five, currently a leaf, is removed. The degree of four goes down by one, four appears in the list again. Each time you see someone in the list, its degree's gone down by one. If and only if. Four will never appear on the list again because currently four is a leaf. And there's no way, the only way four would appear on the list again is if one is deleted. If one is a leaf, right? One would have to be a leaf by that point. But that's not possible because then only there would be only these two vertices left. If one was a leaf and four was its neighbor. And at that point, uh, you, would, you would have stopped. You wouldn't keep the leaf, you, you would be done. So four is definitely not going to appear on the list. And sort of similarly, so four has degree three. By the time it gets deleted, or by the time it's done, it's a leaf. And it will not, you know. And so the number of times it appears on the list is its degree minus one. That's the, that's the conclusion I'm leaning toward. For any vertex, the number of times it appears in the list is its degree minus one. Any questions about that? And that's, that was, uh, that was uh, the first thing we noticed about it. So for example, if you started out as a leaf, degree one, then the number of times it'll appear on the list is zero, and vice versa too. If you see something as one of these numbers, one through eight, is not in this list, those are the leaves. You can read that off right now. Any questions here? Because that's all I need for the next step. Okay, so here's the question. I skipped past the rest of the proof. Uh, now we can answer a question like this. Sorry for the, you see there's something scribbled out there. That was, I, I, I made a mistake, but that's not fair. Uh, imagine that's, that's white out instead of black out. Um, let's ask this question. If I tell you the vertices are one through 10, like this example, how many trees are there or vertices one labeled one and six have degree four, vertex five has degree three, and all the other ones have degree one. So this is one example of this graph. Uh, six has degree four, one has degree four, five has degree three, and the others are The question is how many trees are like there like this? Don't, don't think about it directly. I'm sure you can answer it because this is a small example. If you work on it. But the point is using proof for codes, we get an example like pretty much immediately. We can answer this kind of question. Basically, you, you say which vertex, you tell each vertex which degree it's supposed to have. And then you can say how many trees there are. So don't, don't think about this directly. That's not the way we want to do it. Ready? So here's the thing. Every tree on 10 vertices has this corresponding prefer code. Right? It's, it's a code of uh, length eight. It can contain any of the numbers through one through 10 in, in, those, in those spots. But we are interested in only some of the codes, right? The degree, we know that if the vertex one has, and six have degree four, how many times will one and six appear in the code? Yeah, one is gonna have to be in the code three times. Six is gonna be in the code three times. Five the code twice, and uh, the, the other one's not at all. So these correspond, it's a bijection with this condition, these correspond to proper codes of this form with eight things, which have exactly three ones, exactly three sixes, and exactly two fives. Not necessarily in that order, in any order. And that's easy to count. It's easy to count just words made up with those characters. Yes? In this case, are all the leaves unlabeled? Like we don't have to care where those are specifically. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I could have written as a multi-set, but just for, yeah. But, but to do it, you can temporarily label them if you want to think of it that way. 
but like I'm about to do that. rearranged in different ways. It doesn't yeah. matter. It's the number of lists of length eight, or you could say eight character words, where exactly three of the characters are ones, exactly three of them are sixes, and exactly two of them are fives. So yeah, the fives are identical. They're both fives. Everyone get that? The the that the degrees, yeah. And this is great. So uh, anyone know how, there's a couple ways to do this. Anyone have an answer on how many uh, lists like that are there with this, these specified numbers of digits? There's like three ways to do it, I can think. Two, three, five, okay. two, three. Yeah, yeah. So if you were in combinatorics, <laughs> that you probably this. So first you can you can sort of take these uh, spots A1, think of these as slots, and you're gonna decide how you can put ones into these slots. Well, you pick three of them to be ones. That's eight, choose three. After that, you've got three ones in there. Then you choose, of the remaining five slots, you choose uh, three of them to be sixes. Once you've decided which are ones and sixes, the remaining ones are fives. So actually, I don't need a factor here, because they have to be fives. You can put two, choose two, so that's one. If you're familiar with multinomial coefficients, this is also this thing. It says there's eight spots here. You choose three of them to be type one, three of them to be type two, and two of them to be a third type. It's the same thing. And the formula for this, I mean, you could put it this way, but it actually equals this. It's eight factorial divided by three factorial, three factorial, two factorial. And there's a direct argument for that as well. In case you're interested, this is really a topic for another course, but uh, in case, so ignore this if you want, but um, you can get this formula by thinking of it this way. How many ways are there to arrange this? Let's temporarily color each of the ones different color, like red, blue, green. And the sixes are red, blue, green, and the fives are red and blue. Now, I have eight distinct objects. The number of ways to order them is eight factorial. But then I have to correct them. So I say, actually, red one, blue, green one, blue one, if I had the colors permuted, it really should be the same thing. So it's really not eight factorial. It's, and then you divide to consider all the different ways that you overcome. That's quotient rule. So that's why you divide by three for the, because you over to, I'm not explaining this properly, but that's not this course, because to account for the different uh, permutations of these ones, which are really all the same, three factorial to account for the different permutations of six, which are really all the same, two factorial for that one. I just did this with an example, 10 vertices and uh, certain specified degrees. But if you get the idea for this example, you get the idea in general. And if you look at corollary 2.2.4, it gives you the formula. But um, the formula itself has like a, uh, you know, but to understand the formula, it's probably better to understand this and then just think about how it would generalize. Like if you just see the formula as written, it might look too abstract. But once you make this connection with an example, you'll, you'll be able to figure it out. Any questions about this? Okay. So that's a fun bonus from the, I guess whenever you prove something, it's nice if you learn something else. Um, and there's other things you can get out of it. But, um. Any questions or any thoughts about any of that stuff? Okay. So now, as, uh, and I don't see any chats here, Stop sharing that. Okay, so now uh, Twitch, you should be able to see. Uh, I guess you don't need to see that anymore. People remote should be able to see the board, and now I'm going to go to the board. So uh, thanks for whoever anonymously asked if I could switch to the board because after I prepare my, we'll see how it goes. But now I'm pretty excited about now that I'm I'm, I'm ready. I think this is a good time. Um, uh, handwriting. So I am capable of writing so you can read. Um, and that goes for the remote too because I don't know exactly what it looks like. Um, um, but I will get excited or just lazy or something and I'll forget. So don't hesitate for a moment. If there's something you can't read, say something. Okay. It's, I'll, I'll grab an eraser and fix it. But, all right. So, I already checked that these are on my so that's what I recall that's big enough that you can read it. Anyone out there in the chat world 
Can you read the first thing I've written? Or can you give me a yes or a no on um, the uh, chat? I can't hear you still. Okay, yeah. So you have, I mean, of course you have to switch to make sure that that's the big window there. I need to zoom. Yeah, I'll try to write a bit big, bigger. Is that a tau? Yep, this is a tau. Let tau be equal to the number of spanning trees. Uh, of uh, a graph sheet. More spanning, spanning trees are a good way of keeping track of kind of a connectivity relation. And the more because you have a lot more options to work with. So it's it's a, a basic measure of, of that kind of uh, flexibility you have in your graph. Alright. So by Kaylee's theorem. Of the complete graph is on n vertices and n to the n minus. So imagine you have a complete graph there, its vertices are labeled one through n. So it's a fixed complete graph, its vertices are labeled one through n. And then you want to say what's a spanning tree on it? It's a tree on vertices one through n, it's exactly the same because you have all these edges available. So that's a uh, one thing we know. Here's another case, which is pretty easy. I'll draw a picture. If we have a tree, it's like a tree, but instead it has multiple edges. I mean, it doesn't have to, but you can. So let's say that uh, maybe this is instead of one edge, it has three edges here, this is two edges. Uh, maybe there's three edges there or something like that. So this is another case where it's easy to figure out how many spanning trees there are. What's a spanning tree look like? Basically, each time you have multiple edges, you have to So one, three choices here, two choices, one of two options there, one of three options there. So three product rule, three times two times three. Once you've picked those, you need all the other edges. So that's your only choice. So. Given a spanning tree. Yeah, so this is if, no, if this, is the graph sheet. If this is your whole graph, I mean, this is a weird case, I'm just starting with a, with a simple case. If this is what you have, it's actually easy to do. You just take the product of x. So, this is not an important case, but it'll turn out to be actually kind of, we'll see, it'll come up here. So choose the tree, but not really, but with uh, multiple edges. Then tau of g uh, equals is the product of the edge multiplicity. You know what? Actually, I have a good idea. Well, I don't know if this is a good idea. Let's try it. Let's. Um, Maybe if someone chats something and I don't notice, maybe you'll notice. And it doesn't hurt you to have this up here, right? I don't know. Let's see if that helps. Um, another kind of easy thing is what if you have a loop in the graph? Um, for a loop E in the graph G, a loop cannot be in a spanning tree, so, or in any tree. So if you want to, the total number of trees. So you can just remove that from the graph. It doesn't change the number of spanning trees. Great. So now I have a general approach to something we can do for non-loops. And for that, I need a definition. I'm just figuring out how I'm going to make sure I get all of this on the screen. You're definitely going to need this a lot. So go here.
So contracting an edge. Let's say E is equal to UV, where U and V, U and V are not the same. First, I'll tell you what it means in a graph drawing. It means shrinking the edge E until U meets U V. Shrinking uh, E until U meets V. So um, let me show you the picture and then I'll, I'll tell you. So uh, let's take an example here. Uh, let's say that this is U, this is E, this is V in a larger graph that looks like this. So put a triangle there, an edge, a loop, uh, sorry, a multiple edge there. This doesn't matter too much. Let's have something out there like that. It looks like this BG. And what I mean really is visually, imagine taking this and gradually smushing it, sinking it down. But as you do so, I can't just break the connections. So if I move you down, these little edges here are going to have to kind of stretch out and move with it. Are we merging e and U and V into one vertex? Yep, you're merging, uh, you're merging them. So there's going to be a new vertex here, which is what U and V used to be. U and V used to have a triangle to some vertex there, but now instead that's going to be both U and V. Each of these edges right, come from the same vertex, so I guess I'll finish it. So that's that left side now that it's merged. The right side. And now it used to come here, but now it has to come all the way to V. And I guess we still have that there. And I'm going to call give this vertex a new name because it's different. And this graph is going to be called G dot E. So I'm hoping visually you, you, this, this does what I said it does. It looks like they get smushed and everything kind of gets drawn together with it. Uh, pulled along with it. So now that's visually to explain the idea of it. And actually, if we're doing graph drawings, which we'll do later, this is a technical thing that we need, um, like when we're studying that more. Oh, is there a question? No, no question. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is like a, a real life? Yeah, so I mean, often a thing you introduce is useful for some models, of real world models, and not useful for others. So it's going to be useful for two things. One is, I left this discussion halfway through the middle. It turns out contraction is going to be a piece we need to be able to count spanning trees, build one way. And two, um, there's a whole field of graph drawing, like basically good represent, representing data in terms of graph, and you want to represent it in a nice way on the, on the plane, actually what you're doing, or for other reasons. Um, and it turns out that this is a key concept into understanding, like working with this graph. But it's not so much that like, yeah, I mean, I guess you could imagine like, okay, now the two cities are a metropolis or something. I just made that up, but that's not really the idea. It's more that like for studying the whole structure, this is a good tool to get at that. Yeah, good. Um, I guess that, yeah. Does this step but, extend three vertices? Like, could you contract from three and then you shrink two edges into one single vertex? Uh, uh, interesting, but no, you do, you do two. If I wanted to make all these two, I'd pick two of them at a time. I'd pick one of them, and then I'd pick another one. And then I sort of pay attention to what happened along the way. Uh, and that has to do with how it ends up being used later. As I said. If you want to think, but if, if it helps to think of an application to understand this, 
I would think we're just we're just doing fun drawings. Like this is a thing you can do with like you know, it's a it's a physical object and you're shrinking it. That's probably the best you know intuition. Okay, yeah. Did I already tell you the story. My mom like was disappointed when I showed her. So I have some research related to this that used this, and I was like, like unlike most research, I was actually came up with a proof of a theorem that I can actually present to people. I, I did it in a I am talk or some whatever that talk was. And I was like, mom, check this out. Like, and she was really disappointed. She was like, you know, if you can explain it to me, that's not good. And what she actually said is, you know, you were doing this like in preschool, like coloring and drawing. And what's this? You're still, you got a PhD and you're still doing this? Um, I don't think she was joking. <laughs> Enough about my mom. Uh, contracting the edge E is equal to UV uh, modifies its graph. And that's what we just labeled here. And this is uh, with or without a drawing. So the drawing is probably the best way to understand what, what this is all about. But in the end, we're changing the graph. We're replacing, um, and you don't even need the drawing for this. So what we do is um, u, e, and v are replaced by a new vertex. And just, I have to give it a name, so we'll just call it V. I'm sorry, we'll call it W, just like in the picture, but that doesn't really matter. Such that, as an endpoint, U and V are replaced by, uh, by, by W. U and V? Yeah, uh, U and W, U and V, U and V. U and V are replaced by W. So let me just, it's sort of visually what, what, it, what you think it is. But like, uh, here's a, I'll just swat, let's point to a second. Here's an edge. Its endpoint was this vertex and this vertex U. Now this is the same edge, same name, if we gave it a name, I didn't bother. This endpoint is unchanged. This endpoint is now W instead of U. U is gone. That's W's endpoint. And in the case where you have a, this edge, which has another edge, which also has endpoints both U and V, now both of its endpoints are, are W. Does that mean that we can't undo it? Because like those two edges that go to W, the earlier graph could have been a multiple edge to U or what we have like U and V. It is not uniquely determined if you want to undo. You can undo it, but you have to keep track of which one went to which. So yeah, so that's a great point. So with that operation, uh, now I can give you a, uh, a kind of recursive uh, uh, formula for these, uh, not kind of, the recursive formula for uh, tau uh, number spanning trees, tau g, tau g is equal to tau of g minus e plus tau of g dot e in a depression. And this is for any non loop edge. E of g. So the proof is. Okay, so if there's a picture here, I want to know all the spanning trees. I know you're still writing. I do. Okay. But I'm kind of thinking we're looking for spanning trees in this. And I'm basically going to break it up into two groups. I could say, if you're a spanning tree, you may or may not contain that edge. If you're a spanning tree of this and you do not contain this edge, then basically you're a spanning tree of the graph minus the edge. If you're spanning tree and you do contain that edge, then actually it translates somehow to a, sp a spanning tree of this. There's a bijection from spanning trees that do contain this edge to spanning trees of this. And you can imagine what it is. So this edge will get contracted within the spanning. So actually, that's what the. Now, I understand this part is there, that picture could be all that. Let me just catch up with what we've done so far. Let's see what we've done so far. 
number of spanning trees of G. that do not contain E is equal to the number of spanning trees of G minus E, of course. And then we'll show that the number of spanning trees, spanning trees of, whoops, I said of, of it should be of G that. G. of G that do contain E is equal to tau of G dot E. So I'm going to improve that is what we'll prove. For it to not contain E, that means E is a loop? Is that what that means? No, just a spanning tree is a subgraph. Oh, just it's not it contains some edges and doesn't contain other edges. Some of them will contain E, some of them won't. So you, if you look at all the different spanning trees that could be, first we count the ones that don't contain E, then we count the ones that do contain E, and we have them all. All right. Um, so, drop up right now. Yeah, so I guess I'll start here. Uh, I have to write the claim down. So, claim, if I take uh, T and I send it to T contract E, this is a bijection. from spanning trees of G that contain E to spanning trees of G dot. If I have a bijection between these, then of course that's what I need. That means there's the same number of them. So that's exactly what we have. All right, so let's start off. Uh, let's say if T is a spanning tree of G. That and uh, E is an edge of T then I want to show that it's sent to a spanning tree of this uh, graph so first of all uh, T uh, contract E is a spanning uh, oh so the things we need to show I need to show it's a tree first of all uh, it's connected and because of space at the board, and sometimes it's better not to write every single detail down, I'm not going to say why. I'll just talk about it. I mean, just imagine your mind at this point. Hopefully, you imagine an example of a tree. Pick an edge and contract it. Just the tree itself. I think we believe it's going to be a tree. Yeah. You didn't cut any edge. You didn't cut anything oh, okay. or something like that. Yeah. So how do you, how do you how do you say this though? So kind of connected. The thing is, at this point, we have such good intuition about connected. Now I'm willing to relax a little bit. You do have to write something, but uh, one is you could talk about in terms of components. What happens when you contract an edge? Well, one way to think about let me just maybe this is not a great. Yeah, I'll, I'll erase this later, but let me just make up an example here. I don't know. What so here's an edge E. And this is a tree. All right, so we're going to contract this edge. 
how do I know it's, so it is connected, first of all, because it's a tree. And now when I contract an edge, um, here's one way I could do it. Uh, I could just get rid of the edge first, and then I could identify the two endpoints. Once I get rid of the edge, I, I have exactly two components. We know that, cut edge. And then if I have two components, and then I define a vertex, I think it's pretty clear that if you can get from anything to anything, ah, connected, from any pair of vertices, you have a path from one to the other. I can get from any vertex to any vertex within here. I can get from any vertex to any vertex within here. If I identify these two vertices now, I can use that as a waypoint to get between any two vertices from one side to the other. You get as far as the middle, and then you get to the end. Now, if I have to write that out in words, it's going to take me a whole bit of the board. But connectivity means for any pair of vertices, you can get a path from one to the other. And once you remember that, you can kind of see. Fine, let's move on. Um, it's also spanning for G dot E. Uh, spanning means it contains all the vertices. We started off with this tree, a spanning tree of G. So we have a tree inside a graph, and it already contains all the vertices. We contract within that tree, and now it will contain all the vertices of the contracted graph, because right, we used to have all the vertices. Within that tree, you replace these two by that single vertex, so you still have all the vertices. So and spans g dot e. I'm not saying what we, we said why, but I'm not writing it. And I need to show that it's a tree. I can show that it's acyclic, or I can show that it has the right number of edges. Right number of edges. Look, it's going to lose exactly one edge. So let's do that one. Um, uh, to put it very uh, fast, and e number of edges in e uh, dot, sorry, t dot e, the contracted one, is of course the number of edges in the original tree minus one. Um, right, because we lost exactly one edge. Uh, since t is a tree, that's equal to the number of vertices in the tree t minus one to minus two. Uh, and uh, and now, oh yeah, and now this is, uh, what about the number of vertices in t dot e? That's one less than this, so that's this. So good, it's the right, uh, it's the right formula, connected, the right number of edges, so it's a tree. Spanning tree, yes. So, so we have shown so T dot E is a spanning tree. Of G dot E. Good. That's one direction of the proof. Or one part of the proof, I guess. We don't have a bijection. Part at, least I know that, at least I know that if this is the domain, then this is really the codomain, I guess. That's the all I got. The spanning part comes from the fact that it's connected, the whole thing? The spanning part comes because we started with a tree that contained all these vertices. Within the tree, we replaced these two vertices by one vertex here. So that means we have all the vertices over here. Um, okay, so where are we now? Uh, now we need to show it's a bijection. So moving, let's say that we have a tree in the uh, GOD. So let's say if T prime is a tree in G dot E. So now we're starting with a tree on this graph here, which has already been contracted. Uh, uh, I want a spanning tree, sorry. Is a spanning tree. We just erase it and make it legible. If T prime is a spanning tree of G dot E, um, 
Um, let uh, T be uh, obtained from T prime by replacing W by U, V, and E. So I take whatever spanning tree I have here. If this, say, was an edge here, I have the same edge here. It just changes the endpoint. Of course, this vertex is no longer here, but instead I, I put in both vertices in E. Other question there? Yes. We talked earlier about how that it may not be unique to like expand it again. Does this still capture like the bijection? Uh, I'm looking at those two. Yeah, edges. you're right. So what was I what was I saying earlier? Though? The edges on the left of U and on the left of V that get merged into the one. Like if you undo it, could those two edges end up just actually being like a multiple edge to U? Would that be a value like a? Okay, so here's here's the thing. If I don't know what this graph is, and the only thing I know is that I say W was a contracted vertex and it came from something. Then I would know that this uncontracts and I would know these go to which one endpoint, but I wouldn't know which endpoint. But in this proof, we're saying start with the graph, contract it. So I do know this. I know the original graph. I have a spanning tree within that graph. And now I'm going back to this. Okay, because we're, so we're fixing the graph G and we're preserving that knowledge. That's why we can say it's a bijection. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're starting with the graph, this graph G. That's the reason. That's a, that's a good question for a moment. In the back of my mind, I was also wondering so what, what the, how that worked out. Um, right. Basically, then I claim it works. So then, uh, then T. Uh, prime is equal to t dot e. Now, t, that's not how we defined it. We said, starting with the spanning tree here, we replace w by this edge in these vertices. But if you do that, then with the tree result here, if you contracted it, you would get back your original tree. That's what we're saying. Started here, uncontract, you will definitely get back to the original tree. And uh, T is, basically, I'm just going to write the answer. T is a spanning tree of G. It's sort of a, let's see, let's see what Y. All right, well, we added one vertex, and instead of one, sorry, we added one edge, and instead of one vertex, we replaced that with two. So basically, the number of edges is correct once we do that. Uh, um, in this, so it's so we get that part. Uh, it's still going to be connected, I guess. Uh, if you think after you uncontract, can you get from one vertex to another? Well, you can definitely get from any two vertices. If you look at two vertices here, look at them here from any two vertices. If you can't get to the other, you, you, there is a path, but it might. Here's the thing: between any two vertices, there is a path. It might go through W. Now, if you look here between those same two vertices, that path may get stuck. It may pass through U or V or both of them, I guess. I mean, we don't know. We're trying to make it. But if the path like gets as far as U and then it has to go to V later, just add in the edge U. Or maybe if the path passes by U and then keeps on going, that's also fine. All right. So there's two cases. If you have a path between two vertices here and you look at that sequence of edges over here, it might have a gap at E or it might not. It might just work. And if it has a gap, then you can put even another, there's a path again, so they're connected. And if you and if it just doesn't even use that, then that's fine too. Still connected. So there's two cases there. So T is the right number of edges, it's connected, it's a tree, it's spanning because it contains all the vertices here. You replace W by these two vertices, so it spans, contains all the vertices there. So spanning tree. It's a very similar kind of argument which you could write down. And I think that's the whole proof. Um, right? So we wanted to show a bijection between these two sets. If I have a tree from the first set, I do get a tree from the second set. If I have a tree from the second set, I use can reverse the procedure and get a tree from the first set. So it's a bijection.
All right, so what can we do with this? So we prove this formula for tau of g. Um, and now uh, we can re compute recursively. So now we can compute tau recursively. So for example, let's compute tau of this four vertex graph, which I'll just show as a picture. Uh, four vertex graph with a uh, Uh, I think it's called the diamond, but who cares? All right, so I pick an edge, any edge I want. Let's pick the, the, the diagonal edge, and I can either remove it or I have to remove it or contract and contract it. If I remove it, I just have a four cycle. And if I contract it, I'll just draw a picture. So the these two vertices will stay there. This vertex will contract the middle. So now I have, I guess, that. Everyone agree that's what happens if you squish the diagonal edge. And in this case, both of these are easy to do. Let's, how many spanning trees does a four cycle have? You just figure out by hand. What? Four. four. Yeah, you delete any one edge, you get a, is what you have to do, so four. This is actually the case we did before. How many spanning trees? You have to pick exactly one of these multiple edges and exactly one of these. Two options, two options, two times two. So eight. In this example, we chose the diagonal edge, but we could have chosen, chosen any other. We could have chosen any other edge. And by the way, you might want to try it. If you, I, I did it at home like five minutes ago or whatever. If you choose another one, you'll get like three plus five for the different cases. So this is just a one step, but more generally, you can imagine having a very big graph, picking an edge, you have two cases. And then how do you do those two cases? Well, in each one of them, you pick an edge, that splits into two cases, splits into two cases. And so on and so forth, you keep on going until you get down to some graphs, which are pretty simple, and then you just put the answer, like this or this. But typically, this is exponential time, unfortunately. Oh, so, so one thing is, if you're going to have a base case, you want your base case to have like a bunch of stuff in it, so you can just look it up. And that's kind of where I started there. When you have a tree with multiple edges, those are easy to do. So you, would, you wouldn't do recursion on this one, you would just compute it. So that's one reason that came up. Yeah. Uh, is it necessary the edge that we choose is not a cut edge? Yes. Well, if there's a loop, then, you, then the recursion is just, you just delete the loop and it doesn't change it. So yeah, just delete the loop. So the problem with this kind of recursion is that typically it's exponential time, right? Each time you have to do this, you double the number of cases you're going to have to do. I can make this more precise. It depends on the number of edges overall. It depends on what your base cases look like. Or we're thinking about big, complicated graphs. It's typically like that. So that's not good, right? That's too slow. Maybe still useful for some purposes for understanding and proving theorems about special cases or whatever, but not a practical algorithm for in general. So the next thing I'll do is I'll show you using linear algebra. I'm going to skip a bunch of the linear algebra steps, but I'll show you how it works at least. Uh, there is a fast method. It's called the matrix tree theorem. Now this class, the way I do it, I don't emphasize uh, algebraic side of graph theory a lot, but it's like a huge branch of graph theory um, with uh, totally different kinds of, I mean, different methods for understanding things we want to understand. And this is a, a really important theorem with a lot of implications. So, you know, important to this here. No one, uh, no one in the chat world has complained. So if you don't say anything, I have to assume that my handwriting is good enough for the purpose of you being able to read it. I wonder if it's not an emotionally satisfying experience, yes? Um, for the original proposition that we wrote, are we still in the process of doing that, or was that the end of the proof right there? Uh, that was the end of the proof. We proved that there was a, so uh, here's the here's the proof. We're counting the number of spanning trees in general. Pick an edge. Some spanning trees contain that edge, some don't. So count them in two steps. 
The ones that don't contain the edge, just remove the edge from the graph and that's count the number of spanning trees there. Then we have to count the number of spanning trees that do contain a particular edge. I show that it's the same as counting the number where we can track the edge. To do that, I need to show a bijection between spanning trees that contain an edge and spanning trees in the graph where that edge is contracted. And that's what we did. We gave the, we showed that it was a bijection. Other questions? Good. People seem like they're paying attention, but I don't know. I mean, um, this, this seems like a great time for an anecdote because it just occurred to me. Uh, when I was thinking real analysis, oh, yeah, there's a lot of stories. So one, people said, don't take four classes in a row. That's mad. I was like, I could do it. So I didn't learn a lot of real analysis that semester because I, I ignored all the advice I was given. Um, but uh, 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 people in, in the class, until we started, I, I got in a sledding group like halfway through the semester. Until that point, people thought I was like a smart guy because I don't know, I just looked like I was concentrating some, but I, I was I was half asleep in my student schedule. Didn't know what heck was going on, but everyone thought I, I did. We got a study group. Um, compared to, I didn't really learn my lesson until like the third year of grad school or something. You can imagine how my life was until then. Um, third year of grad school, my friend's like, you know, there's a new professor, he's so nice. He feels bad because like no one's sitting in the front, no one's asking anything. He's like, just to help make your professor feel better, can you, let's just sit in the front and like ask them something. And that was the final thing that convinced me. I was like, okay, I, I can be a big man. I can, I can, I can help out. And then like, I went from like being like confused all the time to like suddenly following everything that was going on. <laughs> in, my, in my third year of grad school, I find it. But you don't have to wait that long. Um, if you, there are things you can do to help yourself pay attention. And one of them is uh, asking, asking stuff and yeah, yeah, talking and talking. And other things like reading it or whatever. But like, uh, you know, I, I blasted all this advice, but all of that advice is like a list of the things I did. All right, so, right, so here's the next result for big O of, I have more embarrassing stories, but hopefully everyone I've told is one. So this is interesting. We'll have a big O of n to the 2.373 time algorithm. Uh, and uh, called, or you can compute it, so whatever it's for. Oh, faster. No wonder this doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to prove that, but I'll just tell you. Here's the matrix. Three zero. It's a formula. Tau of G is equal to minus one to the s plus t, I'll tell you what that is in a second, times the determinant of q star. I'll tell you what that is in a second. But you can see how they compute it. Once you find this matrix, you take the determinant and plug some stuff in. So with this weird time, this is the running time for uh, multiplying two matrices, a size n by n. And it turns out using that, you can compute a determinant. In that, in that, where that's n by n matrix, or n minus one, it doesn't change the value. Weird thing is, so there's some something weird going on there. The obvious way to uh, do a matrix, or an obvious way, it takes n n cube. You expect it to be a random, but it turns out there's this cutting edge research, and they keep on somehow shaving it down. So strangely, it's better than matrix, and I don't think anyone knows what the best n is. Super important because so much of math that happens under the hood. Matrix computation. That's not what we're talking about. But anyway, that's it. so it's basically that's how fast it is to compute the determinant. Way better than exponential time, of course. Now I got to tell you what these things actually are. So uh, for a loopless uh, graph, right? We're not going to want loops anyway because we're looking at spanning trees. So just forget it. On a vertex set v1 through vn, just label them that way. Let q be equal to d minus a. I'm going to tell you if these are matrices. Where, sorry, where a is the adjacency matrix. Of uh, g. 
we called it A of G with, for just for the moment of doing this. And D is just the matrix where the degrees are on the diagonal. So I'll just write that down. And C, uh, so typical, this is one way to put a matrix you could say, it's an n by n matrix and a typical entry is D sub ij. And now I'll tell you what that is, such that D sub i times i, uh, sub D sub i i is the degree of B sub i. And uh, D sub ij is equal to zero when i is not j, so off the diagram. So simple definition. Didn't tell you about Q. Oh, and this is called the Laplacian, and it's good for lots of stuff, although we're not going to study it. Laplacian of a graph. Uh, and uh, Q star is obtained from Q by just deleting any uh, row and column, by deleting the S row and T column. This is the S and T in the formula. But it's really, it doesn't matter what you know when you do, pick whichever one you want. For any S and T, uh, you know, between one and N. So that's a compact way of writing that. Now we have the done. Uh, I'll illustrate it with an example. So actually, let's take the same graph, but I'll label the vertices now. B1, B2, B3, and B1 and B2 are connected also. And B4. Uh, here we take uh, degrees on the diagonal and then subtract uh, the adjacency matrix, so it looks like this. On the diagonal, B1 is degree 2, so we'll have 2. B2 is degree 3, so we have 3, 3, 2. Now, here we'll have, along the top, you subtract how many times B1 is adjacent to the other ones. So in this position, B1 is adjacent to B2, so there's a 1, but we're subtracting it, we have a negative 1. Next, B1 is adjacent to B3, so you get a negative 1 there, too. B1 is not adjacent to B4, so in the adjacency matrix you have a zero. Subtract a zero. Subtract, that's a minus zero? Uh, yeah, minus zero, zero. It's really the number zero. Sorry, where did that zero come in? Is that part of the two minus one minus one? Uh, this is a, matrix, a four by four matrix. This is the this is the, the first row of four columns. Oh, sorry. I thought that was two minus one minus one, as in like one expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that happens. Any, uh, so second row, we need to go across and say, uh, well, it's symmetric. So B2 is adjacent to B1, B3, and B4. So you get a minus one in each of these divisions B1, B2, B4. B3 is similarly adjacent to B1, B2, B4. B4 is adjacent to not to B1, but yes to B2. So that's the matrix, Q. And now, um, now to compute this formula, I need to pick an S and a T. So I can pick anyone I want, but I'm going to pick, uh, let's just try S is equal to T is equal to two. They don't have to be the same. So let's just pick two. So I'm going to cross out that row column and look at the rest of it. So I need, sorry, the tau of G is going to be equal to minus one raised to the two plus two times the determinant, and I'll use the, uh, of the matrix where I've removed the second row and column. So that means I have two, negative one, zero, second row is entirely gone, and I have minus one, three, minus one, and I have zero, minus one. And you take the determinant. And I'm not gonna do that of you, but if you can do it, and you get it, which obviously is yeah. all. So.
Okay, that is supposed to illustrate the theorem statement. So take a look at that, digest that, and see if you have any questions. Can you pick any S and any T and yes. put on the same answer? Any S and any T, you'll always get the same answer. Any questions? Uh, so let's prove. I'm not going to prove the whole thing. Unsurprisingly, there's linear algebra involved, which I'm just going to skip entirely. And I'm just going to talk about the sort of graph theory connection to the matrices and those ingredients. And if you want to learn the rest of it, you can read it and <clears throat> remember your linear algebra or look up the linear algebra theorems you need. So, uh, claim one, if M is the incidence matrix, of an orientation of G, I emphasize any orientation of G, then uh, Q is equal to M uh, uh, dot product transpose of M. So it'll illustrate with an orientation of G. So let's take the same uh, graph here. But now I'll add edge directions to it. It doesn't actually matter which the directions are, but um, and also add edge labels. So let's say this is edge A, goes that way, this one goes down, that's B, this next one goes down, that's C, this next one goes up, that's D, and the bottom one goes to the right, and I'll call that E. So there's an arbitrary orientation, and now the incidence matrix looks like this. So the rows are indexed to the vertices, let's put them there to help us keep track. And the columns are indexed to the edges. A goes from V1 to V2. We get a plus one where it's coming from and a minus one where it goes to. Just like when we do the degree counts, right? Coming out is a plus one. So we get one here and minus one there, and the others are not involved in zero. B goes from V1 to V3, so one, zero minus one, zero. C goes from V2 to V3. D goes from V4 to V, V2, so one and a minus one in those. And E goes from V3 to V4, so one minus one. Just to keep it interesting, uh, it's, it's already, you might already be asking like, Really just pick any orientation? What if I picked another orientation? How would that change what we've done so far? We just negate the like two entries in any column, any column. Right, so if I switch the order of E, it would flip the which one was one and which one was minus one, or multiply the column by minus one. All right, so now let's think about what the dot product is. Um, <clears> oh, <throat> uh, yeah, so I didn't, so let's say proof. That's why. So we're proving this. Um, let's just look at, so uh, if, uh, for convenience, let's say that Q, entries of Q are I and J. That's just a shorthand to write that that's what I'm going to call the IJ entry of that matrix Q then the formula for Q I sub J is equal to, each one comes from, uh, wait, why did I put a dot there? Those make, these are matrices, it's just the product. I mean, you can put a dot there, but it's a, it's a matrix product, sorry. When you, get, uh, when you multiply two entries, uh, matrices, each entry is the row of the first one times the column of the second. Right? 
but a column of the transpose is a row of the original matrix. So it's going to be uh, basically uh, row i of m, and this is actually a dot product, dot row j of m. And then honestly, just look at it. Let's look at the example, and you'll, you'll see that's true. So I claim that um, I'm basically just going to write the answer, and then we'll look at it and convince ourselves it's true. I claim that this actually does give me the degree of V um, if I is equal to J. So what if I see the, the dot product of a row by itself? I get, let's say, row 2 by itself. I get minus 1 times minus 1, 1, plus 0 times 0, 0. Each time I see a minus one or a one, it gets multiplied by itself. It gives me one. So basically, I'm counting the number of elements, which are one or minus one. Each one of those for V2 corresponds to an edge coming in or out, but it just counts the total number of times it's an end point, number of edges. Yeah, so that's it. That counts the number of edges. Instead. One more time, make sure we caught this. Why did the plus or minus not matter? Because when you take the dot product with itself, each minus one gets squared. So either way, that you get the same thing. So that's kind of interesting. Now, what if i is not equal to j? I claim it is the uh, minus, we should get minus a sub ij, where that's from the adjacency matrix. So let's just look at an example, two and three. Let's take the dot product of these two rows. Minus 1 times 0, you get 0. 0 minus 1 times minus 1, you get 0. The only time you actually get anything other than 0 is if you have a 1, if you have both of them are non-zero, right? Uh, well, look at this column C. Why are they both non-zero? Oh, because these are the endpoints of that edge. The only time you get uh, anything other than 0 is when that column is an edge and these are both in. So, and what do you get? You get one of them has to be 1 and one has to be minus 1 because oriented graph, right? That's, that's how the matrix is. So for every edge where it's an, you know, both endpoints are, are, I guess, V2 and V3, you'll get a minus one. Okay, so overall this counts minus the number of edges between those two words. So you just kind of illustrate it. That's, that's what it is. You write it out in words, all the things we've observed, and that's the proof. Um, claim two, and where am I going to, this is going to take a little longer. I think so. Claim two, if B is any N minus one by N minus one, uh, sub matrix of M, Then the determinant of B is equal to, it's either plus or minus one. I don't, I'm not going to say which. If the columns of B, I guess the columns of B, yeah, correspond to edges of a spanning tree. Ah, that's good. At least we have a spanning tree connection somehow. And it's zero otherwise. Yeah, does the determinant have something to do with that spanning trees? That's as much as I'm going to prove about this theorem. But at least we see that connection there. Or we're about to. Oh, and also the, you know, losing a row in a column now uh, is also relevant. So that's great. Uh, all right, so here's how we'll prove it. Um, so it's an if and only if. So, so if the columns uh, correspond to edges of 
a spanning tree T. Uh, then since T is a tree, it has a leaf, actually has two leaves. So some uh, row uh, and column corresponds to a leaf B sub I and uh, its uh, you know incident edge uh, E sub J. And this is, by the way, if n is at least two. If n is one, it doesn't have a loop. But let's just go with this first. Um, let b sub prime be obtained by removing that row and column. You'll see why in a second. This is the whole idea. So here's what the matrix looks like, very roughly. And now let's think about what that row and column look like. V is a leaf, so it's incident to exactly one edge. This is the only edge it's incident to. So when you look at this, it's all zeros except for that one position. So zero, 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 zero. I don't know if this is plus or minus one. I don't know. When I look at this column, this edge has exactly two endpoints. So, you know, somewhere else it's. Have you seen the symbol minus plus one? It just means there's some kind of coordination. If this is plus one, this is minus one. And actually, we don't even care that much, but as long as we're here, that's a nice way to talk about it. This edge is, of course, has two endpoints. So, otherwise, it's all zeros. Something like that. Well, if I was going to take a determinant, and I know that the matrix looks like this, I'm really happy because I know where I'm going to start, right? Let's expand on you know, this row. I don't even care about that, right? Because almost all of it will drop out except for this times the rest of the thing. And that's pretty much what we're, that's the whole idea. Because of this, then the determinant of B is equal to plus or minus one times the determinant of B prime. That's the rest of the matrix. And uh, B prime corresponds to if you remove the vertex and you remove that edge, what's left is another tree, right? B prime corresponds to the other columns and other vertices, so B prime corresponds to tree. Moreover, if we remove that vertex, and it's a spanning tree of the graph minus that vertex. So of uh, g minus b sub i. Great. Uh, we can apply induction. By induction, uh, it's the right b prime corresponds to smaller trees, smaller spanning tree. So the determinant b prime is equal to plus or minus one. Now I don't know if these correspond. But overall, I'm happy I plugged that in and I'm good. I just need a base case. Actually, you might want the base case of n is equal to 2 if you think about it. If n is equal to 1, then b is actually the empty, then this formula is determinant of b. Actually, B is a zero by zero submatrix. So let's put empty set here to represent a zero by zero submatrix. It's something you never think of a zero matrix with nothing in it. But uh, by definition, I don't know if you I don't know if you talk about this linear algebra, but by definition, you would say that the, the determinant of that is one, which is what we need. Now, why is this true? 
Why is fact one fact? Why is zero factorial one? Just because it's convenient. It's because it's convenient. Yeah, if you do the formula and you see how it looks, it'll always work out. So if you think about how you take determinants, just imagine you're always picking a row, picking a column, right? You have a multiplying factor, and then you write five times a smaller matrix. Let's go down from a one by one matrix. Think about that operation. One by one matrix. How would you expand it in that way? Delete that one row and column, basically delete that one vertex. Take that term and multiply it by whatever's left after erasing that, which is this not matrix of nothing in it. So it should be that entry times the determinant of the matrix with nothing in it. Well, it should just be that entry. That's the answer. So this, this has to be one for that kind of a recursive approach to make sense. It's okay. like a multiplicative identity sort of? Yeah. It's, yes. Yes. Or like determinant identity. Not too good. But, um, other questions? Nope. All right. So we are not quite. Yeah, I'll just hand wave the rest of it. So, um, all right. So what have we shown? We've shown that if it do, if the columns do correspond to a span tree by induction, the determinant really is plus or minus one. Now I have to show what if the columns do not correspond to a span tree. I'll show that it's zero. And it's really nice. Um, actually, let me just point to this because I don't, if I think about writing it on the board, I will run out of time immediately. Let's consider an example okay, which doesn't correspond to a spanning tree. Uh, n minus one edges, so four vertices, a spanning tree would, n minus one, n minus one submatrix, so, uh, right, so there's n minus one edges, which could have been a tree, but it's not. So three edges that don't correspond to a spanning tree, that's like a cycle. Or it's actually a graph with exactly one cycle, but there's definitely a cycle in it. It has the right number of edges for a spanning tree, but it's not a spanning tree. Somehow they got to rearrange it in a way. It's not a. It's got to have a cycle in it. Moving on. What happens if you look at the columns corresponding to a cycle? Let's do it. Like C, D, and E. I want to show that the determinant. Uh, what, well, what, what's going to happen is that there's going to be a linear combination which is zero because you basically go around the cycle. So C, D, and E, this is not a directed cycle, right? By the way, E, D, oh, it is actually. In this case, E, D, and C all go around. And in fact, because of that, if you go E, then D, right? This is gonna, since, since the, the head meets the tail of the other one, these line up and you just add them together, they cancel. And you'll still have a minus one and a one, or a minus one and a one. And then again, the other ones, the head table counts. Anyway, the, you add them all together and they cancel. What if one of them was oriented the other way, like in A, B, and C? They're not oriented the right way, A, B, and C. Well, A and C are, but B is in the wrong direction if you wanted to do it. Just multiply the column by one, negative exactly. one. Exactly, multiply the column by negative one. It's a linear combination. <clears throat> so one times this, minus one times that, one times that, and they'll again cancel. If you have a linear combination of columns that's, uh, zero, then the determinant's gonna be zero. <clears throat> so I didn't have time to write it, but I think with that example, it's, it's super clear. And that's the end of that, or at least as much as I can show you. So thanks, I hope that worked. Um, that's it, yeah. We're basically going to do sec start with section 2.3. I'm skipping most of the rest of the. I'll just mention some of the end of a couple of things. I'll literally mention them. 2.2, and we're on to the next section, which is uh, uh, tree algorithms. Okay. Well. Yeah.